قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته And welcome to this new episode of Ask Zad As usual, our first of three questions from the emails is from Hassan. Hassan says, there is a hadith that says that a woman can take a man's intelligence away and another one that says there is no great fitna for men than women. What is the interpretation of these hadiths? As for the hadith they have referred to in the beginning, the Prophet says, alayhi salatu wasalam, I have not seen any lacking in reason and religious commitment, but at the same time, more able to rob wisdom of the wise, except one of you women. So when they complained and inquired, why would we be lacking in reason and in religious commitment? The Prophet ﷺ explained by saying, your lacking uh, of reason is Allah mentioned in the Quran that the testimony of one man is equal to two women. So you are half of the man's testimony. And the lacking of religious commitment is that a woman has her monthly cycle which prevents her from praying and fasting for about a week every month. And that would reduce her religious commitment, not that she's sinful, of course, but because of that which Allah is testing her with, she, she is lower in religious commitment than a man is. And the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, but at the same time, women are more able to rob the wisdom of a wise man. They have this wit, this ability to do such a thing with a man. So what does this mean? It means that the Prophet ﷺ is highlighting to us the fitna and the test which women impose upon men due to their nature, due to their character, due to what Allah has installed in men, where men are known to be fond of women. So women with their charm and their ways can deprive a wise man from his intellect and they can play with him like children play with a toy and we see this in real life. Someone who's wise, who's knowledgeable, who is sought after for his advice, all of a sudden trips and flips when a woman captivates his heart and mind. He's wrapped around her finger and she has full control over him. And we wonder, subhanAllah, what's wrong with this guy? He's known to have a sound reasoning. But now look at him. This happens. Now, we cannot sugarcoat this. This is part of our religion. Whether you like it or not, who cares? It is part of what Allah mentioned in the Quran. It is part of what the Prophet mentioned in the Hadith. That men have a higher level than women. Men have a higher step 
over women. And men are guardians and protectors, as mentioned in Ayah 34, Chapter 4, Surah An-Nisa. Al-Rijalu Qawwamun ala nisa Men are guardians and protectors of, over women for two reasons. Number one, because Allah favored men over women. End of the story. We, we can't sugarcoat this. We can't beat around the bush. This is how it is in Islam. You like it? You're more than welcome. You don't? <laughs> no problem. However, this does not degrade women. It doesn't mean that women are worthless as so many men use such hadith to look down at their wives or their daughters and sisters. Imbecile ignorance. They do this all the time. This does not change the subject that Allah Azza wa Jal had favored men over women. Nevertheless, the Prophet highlighted alayhi salatu was salam, the aspects that women lack some competencies when it comes to men. And that is the lacking of memory sometimes in the case of testimony. So many women could be much more intelligent than men. They can be higher in education and in degree. They can be professors in mathematics and physics. And men can be deficient, can be ignorant, don't have the capacity. Yet what the Prophet was referring to was an aspect of Sharia, ah, which is related to testimony and being a witness over a specific thing. Likewise, their religious commitment, their inability to pray for seven or eight days a month or fast, this is a test from Allah, something that Allah preordained upon women. Women have no control over it and there's no sin on them. Nevertheless, this is how Allah Azza wa Jal mandated it. But there are so many women who exceed men in religious commitment. They pray more night prayer, they fast more voluntary fasting, they read more Quran, they can be more knowledgeable in Islam and in fiqh, in aqeedah, does not mean anything that they are of a lower grade that we look down upon them. But this is how Allah made things so that the ship of life could sail on with one captain and lots of uh, um, assistants and helpers and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Hafsa says, in India, nikah is done on one day and usually the next day walima is done. Walima is the feast and the food that we invite people to come to celebrate such a marriage. On Nikah day, bride's father gives dinner party. Is this allowed because some people say only Walima feast is from the Sunnah, hence this is not permissible. Kindly clarify. We've answered this question many, many times and we said that the Sunnah is that the groom carries out all financial expenses of the marriage. And the girl and her parents don't chip in a penny. So the walima is 100% the responsibility of the groom. But it is a cultural thing where the father of the bride would like to host another walima or a dinner party so that he would invite as many guests of his own. You see, when the walima is conducted, the groom may tell his father-in-law that you can invite 10 people because he's the one who's paying. So he can invite the father and the father can bring nine other people with him. This is my budget. Therefore, lots 
of the people, lots of the, in, in lots of the cultures, the father of the bride says, mm, okay, that's fine. I'm going to host a gathering. You, my son-in-law, may bring 20, 30 from your side, but I'm inviting like 50 or 100 from my side. There's nothing wrong in that. There's nothing that goes against the Sunnah or Islam, and it's a cultural thing uh, altogether. The final question is from Amber. Uh, she says, how does a woman cover her face in ihram? Is a separate scarf okay to use, and can it touch the face? First of all, again, the Prophet ﷺ did not specify how a woman should cover her face. Rather, he prohibited a woman in the state of ihram, when she's performing umrah or hajj, to wear the niqab. And the niqab is a face covering that has holes in it, naqb. So this is a niqab. And this is prohibited in the state of ihram for women. They can throw something on their faces, a layer, two, three, depending on the transparency of that and how they are able to see, because we don't want them to put a blindfold. That wouldn't be logical. So maybe one layer at night and two layers in the daytime would conceal her face, but at the same time would not hinder her from seeing the road and seeing what's in front of her. This is permissible. Whether it touches your face or not, it has no relevance. So what some schools of thought mandate upon women to wear a structure or a hat that has a structure in front of it so that they can throw the face cover on top of it and it would be like a car bumper. It wouldn't allow the face cover to touch their face, saying that this is haram, this is totally baseless. This has no foundation in Islam, none whatsoever. And it's prohibited to wear, because this is an innovation. So, like Mother Aisha, Mother Asma, her sister, said in the hadith, we performed hajj with the Prophet ﷺ, and we used to uncover our faces. And the moment riders passed by us, we used to throw something and cover our faces with. That's it. No niqab and uh, nothing of that sort, and Allah knows best. Uh, our first caller is Yusuf from the Emirates. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullah. Uh, my question for tonight is, um, so a person for many years, whenever he slept and he intended to pray Fajr, but then wakes up like at 9 a.m. and misses Fajr. He wakes up and then decides to go back to sleep and is too tired to pray. Um, he wakes up at 11 and thinks that he should not pray because he has missed the time of prayer, so he, so he shouldn't pray. It. Uh, but then he goes and asks the sheikh, and the sheikh tells him, no, you should still pray in that, in that situation. If that person is still not convinced, uh, what should he do in this situation? Like, uh, should he make up these missed prayers? Or what, is, what is he supposed to do? First of all, what he has done is a major sin. The Prophet said in an authentic hadith, alayhi salatu wasalam, whoever oversleeps a prayer or forgets it, two reasons, oversleeping or forgetting it, must pray it as soon as he remembers, quote unquote, or wakes up. There is no, the Prophet says, والسلام, there is no expiation other than that, other than what? Other than praying it as soon as you remember or wake up. Which means that if you wake up at nine o'clock and you find out that the sun has already risen and you said to yourself, well, it might as well go back to sleep, you have not done the expiation mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet والسلام, and hence, you cannot pray it when you wake up at 11. Even if you do, it has no value and you're sinful big time for this major sin. So what the Sheikh told you is 
incorrect and you have to start from today to man up and to sleep early and to make prayers your priority in life. Otherwise, you are in deep trouble. Salman from India. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Okay, so question, my question is, in, in Ramadan, while doing wudu one day, I spat out water only once from my mouth after rinsing it. I swallowed what was remaining deliberately. And I also felt coldness in my throat when I swallowed it. So will that fasting be counted? Did you drink yes or no? Yes, I drink while doing wudu. If you drank while doing wudu deliberately, you have the, your fasting is broken. There is no other answer to that. The question that might arise is, Sheikh, I rinsed my mouth in wudu. I spit it out. So there's nothing in my mouth. And I swallowed my saliva, which, of course, had the taste of water, but... I didn't drink. I spit everything in my mouth and I swallowed my saliva. Is my fast valid? The answer is yes. You didn't drink water. You had no water left in your mouth. You spit it all out. But if you kept some water and you swallowed it intentionally to drink, your fast is broken. Uh, we have Ashraf from Germany. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa I want to ask you about the ruling of uh, reading Surah Al-Fatiha uh, for Ma'amum in uh, Salat Al-Jahriya. Barakallahu feek. Wa feek barakallah. This is an issue of dispute among scholars. And the main pillars of this dispute are Imam Abu Hanifa, who says you don't read the Fatiha behind the Imam. And Imam Al-Bukhari, who says you must recite the Fatiha behind the Imam in all rak'ahs. And the middle path was chosen by Imam Malik, may Allah have mercy upon them all, who said in silent rak'ah, it is a fard that your prayer is invalid to recite the Fatiha. If you don't recite the Fatiha in silent rak'ah, in, in silent rak'ahs, your prayer is invalid as a ma'moom, as a follower. But in loud rak'ahs, like the two rak'ahs of Maghrib, of Isha, and of Fajr, the recitation of the imam is sufficient for you. You don't have to. But if you do, there's no problem. But you don't have to. And if you deliberately skip it, there's no problem. His, his recitation is sufficient for you. And this, is, was, and this was the choice also of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, who had a small booklet written on this topic by the name of Al-Ilmam Bihukm al-Qira'ati Khalf al-Imam. And this is what he concluded, may Allah have mercy on them all, and this is what I'm inclined to, in a nutshell. Loud rak'ahs, when the Imam is reciting, this suffices for those behind him, they don't have to recite. Silent rak'ahs, they all must recite or their prayer is invalid. Um Amina from the Emirates. Assalamu alaikum. Salamatullah. So I do wash my hair once a week and I spend a lot of time uh, to wash it, like good conditioning. So sometimes I have uh, water in my ear. Uh, can I do things when I'm fasting or my fast is broken if I have water in my ear? If you, if you eat and drink through your ear, no, the fasting is broken, but nobody drinks and eats from their ear because the ear is not a normal passage to the stomach, nor your eye, nor the ornaments I put on my feet and I find the taste in my, um, uh, uh, my throat. All of these are not normal passages to my stomach. So the only thing that would invalidate my prayer, my fasting is what goes in my mouth or through my nose because these are passages to your stomach and Allah knows best. Mustafa 
from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. How are you? Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. I am fine. Zakallah khair. I have a question uh, that uh, why we uh, call Allah Him? Uh, why we refer uh, Allah as Him? Allah why Azza wa Jal does not have a gender. But due to the fact that in Arabic and in English, we have two genders, masculine and feminine. So we refer to Allah Azza wa Jal with the most prominent, most honorable, and the higher of both of each. And that is the masculine pronoun. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used in the Qur'an to describe himself. So we stick with that and we use it and Allah knows best. We have Fahim from Bangladesh, but I don't know if it's the same Fahim or a different Fahim. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. It's a different Fahim. Wa alaikum assalamu alaikum. It's the same, same time from Bangladesh. So you don't have okay. the right to ask two questions at the same time. You have to go to the bottom of the list. We have more than 25 questioners waiting for their term. So do sorry, forgive Sheikh. me. Sorry, Sheikh. I haven't asked any, asked any question today. I haven't asked any question today so far. Ah, oh, so you skipped it. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So a relative from another city sent money to my bank account for donation to needed relatives in my city. Hmm. But I have an equivalent amount of extra liquid cash in my home. As a form of exchange for donation, can I use that liquid cash instead of that particular bank money or must I have to withdraw and use the bank money? Jazakallah. The, jazak. the moment someone sends you money to your bank account, let's assume it is $50 and he wants you to use this to donate. The $50 in the bank account or the $50 under your mattress or in your wallet has the same value. So by using the one in your wallet for the donation, as if you withdrew the money from the bank and took the money from your wallet and placed it back in the bank again. It's the same thing. There is no problem. You don't have to withdraw it from the bank. Alhamdulillah. Wasim from India. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. I asked you last Saturday, but you didn't understand it. You misunderstood it. My great grandfather, while digging a property owned by him, found some buried gold, and he took it without informing the property owner. And he, the gold amount is unknown. Most likely, he didn't pay any funds either. I read from Islam Q website, and what I understood is uh, the treasure found by Kafir, who is not a dhimmi, after paying one fifth funds, he can take the rest. Whenever, wherever I found, I tried uh, to get Wallahi, Wasim, Allah, Wasim, 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 I cannot understand your English. I don't remember your question, and I would highly recommend that you either contact my website and write the question in simple English without details so that I could answer you over there, or contact me through phone and be a little bit more elaborate so that I could understand you and not waste your time uh, through these exchanges where I can't understand you at the moment. We have a short break. Stay tuned and inshallah, we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today I'm going to talk about the book Interactions of the Greatest Leader. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ordered that they be respected and appreciated. An example of that is when he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prohibited feeding them food that others would not like to eat. Aisha radiallahu anha May Allah be pleased with her, reported that the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was given a dub, a large type of lizard, as a gift, but he did not eat it. So Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, said, O Messenger of Allah, should I not feed it to the poor? The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam responded, Do not feed them, 
what yourself do not eat. That is a direct application of the saying of Allah, which means, O you who believed, spend from the good things which you have earned and from that which we have produced for you from the earth, and do not aim toward the defective therefrom, spending from that while you would not take it yourself, except with closed eyes, and know that Allah is free of need and praiseworthy. Reported by Ahmad, Al-Albani ruled it sound, Hassan, in his book, al sahiha Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. Brother Ibrahima from Guinea. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May Allah bless you, your family, and your team, Sheikh. And uh, you as well. Sheikh, hmm. I recently heard a fatwa of yours saying that it was not uh, permissible to follow people who post haram content. And of course, I have no issues there. <laughs> My question is. What about like people like uh, Dai? Yes. What about it? There are women appearing on the screen for some seconds or less or more sometimes. Not in all the videos, but it happens. Okay. So what? Okay. This is different, Akhi. What is random is different than following an influencer on Instagram where she posts her pictures in bikinis, for example, or a da'i who always comes with women and random da'is, female da'is, and exchange laughs and crack jokes, and mashallah, everything is normal. The only thing remaining is the marriage contract. This is different. When we say that you are not allowed to follow people who post haram things, we're talking about the majority. Such da'is who come with females and women and interact freely, and these are da'is on the gates of hellfire, like the Prophet said, alayhi salatu because this is not Islam, what they're doing. This is a mutilated form of Islam. Islam is according to Quran and Sunnah. This is free mixing. Where is it allowed in Quran and Sunnah to crack jokes and to talk about such inappropriate stuff? And then you attach to it Islamic, like attaching everything that is uh, halal to all of things. So this glass is halal. The fish you buy in the market is halal. The vegetables, cucumbers is halal. What is this? It's just a label. So it's a different thing from, for example, when you have a good lecture in a country that has no segregation rules. And the sheikh is giving a beautiful lecture, beneficial lecture, and the director mistakenly every like 10 minutes goes for a second or two to the audience and you may glance a woman here and there. The content is halal. But some of it is haram, lower your gaze. No one, it's, it's like saying, Sheikh, what's the ruling on going to the park and there are women who are not covered? Okay, school, malls, the street, the hospital. So you want to confine yourself to a bubble and not leave the house? This is something that you have to be exposed to. This is different than going to a nightclub or going to a, a prom where there is free mixing and music without any legitimate reason for that. And I hope this makes sense. Sayyid from India. Assalamu alaikum, Sayyid. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, I have a question, uh, actually. Good for you. Uh, how can I increase my iman, Sayyid? Well, <laughs> you have to go to my YouTube channel and you will find lots and lots of materials to help you do that. This is a Q&A session, my friend. We can't answer a question with a lecture. Otherwise, this yani, uh, uh, goes against or defies the purpose of a Q&A session. Sumaya from the UK. Sumaya. 
Sumeya from the UK. Assalamu alaikum. From Salam to Allah. Um, so my question is, um, so last day of Ramadan, um, I had lots, I had difficulty fasting and I know this is, um, it's not supposed to be difficult, but I had cough, I was a bit sick, but I was fasting. And then each, each time I cough, um, I was thinking about saliva coming to my lips. And so I decided to ignore everything that comes to my lips. And even if it was big or small, I ignored everything and just continued my fasting. Um, so was this right? Yes, it was right, inshallah. Hajja from the U.S. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Allah. Okay, I have a question here about the, the, the salatu, two questions anyway, the salatu tasbih, you know, um, do, if I have to make the, you know, what you read between the two, the two sajada, what you read between the two sajada, if I could read that, the whole four and then if I could. Salatu tasbih hajja is, an issue of dispute among scholars. The vast majority of scholars, such as Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Al-Qayyim, Sheikh Ibn Baz, Ibn Uthaymeen, they rendered it as a fabricated hadith. And hence, it is not permissible for you to offer them because the hadith is fabricated. The format of the prayer is one of a kind not found in any other prayer similar to it. And finally, the only narrator of the hadith was Al-Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet والسلام, And none of the companions had ever reported such a hadith with huge and immense reward, which the Prophet said, whether you do it once in a year, once in a month, once every week, once every day, or once in a lifetime, it's the same. There's nothing like that at all. Therefore, the hadith is not authentic, so don't pay attention to it. Binta from Italy. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. So I didn't understand how to know uh, if a video that like have uh, halal content, but uh, there is a person in the video that is doing haram, like uh, eating with the left. How to know if it's permissible to watch or not? The content of the video, if it is all in all halal, and it is not propagating or endorsing anything haram, it's okay to watch. So someone who is presenting the news and telling us what is happening in Gaza, and while doing this, he's clean shaven. He doesn't have a beard. This is a sin. But his sin is on him, not on me. So I can benefit from the content which is halal to watch and learn and benefit from. If someone is giving a cooking show and showing me how to cook salmon with this sauce or with that, and in the process, he eats with his left. It is haram for him, not for me. But if he is, for example, drinking wine and saying that we have to drink wine with uh, uh, Emetel cheese after dinner or whatever, pff, whoa, we have to stop here because this is a major sin. And he's endorsing it. He's calling us to do it. So I hope this makes sense. Imad from Sweden. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, Sheikh, I know a person. This person's father is old. Um, my friend, uh, this, this person is my friend, and he has a half sibling from uh, this father. Unfortunately, the siblings are not on good conditions. My friend uh, is in a very bad financial state. Uh, his sibling is living in a much better standard than my friend. The money that uh, the father owns is from a factory that my friend helped in a major way to spend and spent a good portion of his life to get the factory where it is. 
Um, while the other uh, the other siblings did nothing and are getting benefit from my friend's work while he's li my while he's living in a bad state, my friend sibling gets the money from the father because he is deceiving him because he is old, and my friend has been obedient to his father for decades in this matter and uh, done as he as the father commanded, and uh, let the sibling take the money. Now my friend has fled the country, and uh, with his children due to how bad his state is. While the other sibling is living in luxury. The now, question. Uh, the question. Um, written authority from the father uh, from a while back that gives my friend authority to take from his sibling what he thinks he deserves. Did my friend use this written authority and take what he thinks he deserves and make his father displeased? Or should he, he and his children stay in this bad state? Barakallah. Ufikum barakallah. This is an issue of dispute between the siblings and their father. I cannot hear it from one side and decide that, okay, you have a prior authorization, so now you can take whatever is yours because it's not his. Now, the, the money belongs to the father, and the father did not steal anything from his elder son, who's your friend. Rather, the other son is cheating his father, he's abusing his father, he's fooling his father, and he's taking some money. This is between the father and the son. The other son who fled the country cannot use this paper to steal from his own father against his will, even if his father is old or in dementia or is not in control, unless he has proof that his wealth is being squandered and wasted by his younger brother. And as, as I said, this is his word against his word. And I cannot judge in this thing. Maybe your friend is lying. Maybe your friend is not telling the truth. Maybe the other sibling is taking it lawfully from his father due, due to some reasons between them. I cannot judge this, and this cannot be judged by one man show, meaning that your friend would just come in and do whatever he wants with this authorization which is old and should not be effective by now because the other heirs of the father who is old and may be in dementia must approve of what is happening and Allah knows best. Muhammad from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamualaikum. Uh, Sheikh, I asked, this, I asked you this question through the website, but I think it didn't go through, so I'm sorry if you got it. Nevertheless, Sheikh, I'm not 18, and to get married in Pakistan, you have to be 18. So some time ago, I asked you if I can grab the authorities and get married. But the problem with that is if I were to do that, and that marriage wouldn't be registered, my children wouldn't get my name, and et cetera, et cetera. So I thought about it. What if I just bribe the authorities to change my age and then get married? It is not permissible to bribe for such a reason. Because bribe is a major sin. And it is cursed by Allah Azza wa Jal, whoever gives the bribe and whoever takes the bribe. Unless there is a legitimate reason such as when the government official is preventing you from receiving what is lawfully yours in Islam and in law, or imposing upon you penalties that are not legal and not halal just because he wants to get bribed. But in the case of marriage, you cannot bribe someone to change your age. You can try and get married without registering your marriage until you reach the legal age and maybe try to not have children, maybe try to get married outside of the country. Whatever you need to do, which is legal and halal, try to do it and Allah knows best. Abrar from Bangladesh. Abrar. Adrian from Siberia. Hello? Yes, you are? Abrar. Hello? Abrar, buy a new headset. Assalamualaikum. I'm Abrar. Alaikum assalam. Yes, what can I do for you? Hello. Okay. Abrar, 
headset is not working. Adrian from uh, Serbia. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum <laughs> salamu So my father forced me to eat for two days in Ramadan. Uh, do I have to fast for two for two months or just make up for the, for those two days? When you say he forced you to eat during Ramadan, did he hold a knife or a gun to your head? No, but uh, uh, forced me. How? He would, he would maybe beat me. Or... If he beats you and you ate, no, you don't have to make up for this missed, uh, the skipped day if you continued to uh, fast. See, if someone comes and exerts pressure on you and you're compelled, so he has a gun and you know he's going to use it, or he has a knife, or he's going to belt you and hit you really hard and he's going to hurt. In this case, Islam says you're forced. You may eat or drink until this is stops and then you continue your fasting and your fasting is totally permissible but if you ate and drank and took the rest of the day off and kept on eating and drinking then this is a skipped day you have to make it up now there is no fasting of 60 days except for having sexual intercourse with your spouse or with another person during the daytime of Ramadan while fasting. Breaking your fast, you have to make up for that day alone, and Allah knows best. Burhan from India. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sir, Sheikh, I have a question. Uh, like on the social media, what's happening right now? Is it allowed for the uh, woman to speak publicly? Okay. We've said this so many, many times. Regardless of what's happening in the world, women speaking publicly, whether it's politicians or for da'wah or for a press release or for an interview, this all defies the purpose of the hijab. And if you were to go back to the time of the best of generations ever, and that is the time of the Prophet ﷺ and the companions, you would find that the most intellectual and smart and highly decorated women on earth, such as Mother Aisha, Mother Hafsa, and the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, had never ever talked publicly, though they far exceed in knowledge, in intellect, in uh, eloquency, they far exceed the vast majority of men among the companions, yet they've never delivered a lecture or a speech in the masjid, though they are the mothers of all those attending. They can never marry them. They are the mothers of the believers. So how would it be possible for a woman putting makeup and foundation on her face and maskhara, or they call mascara, and the whole nine yards to come, slight lipstick, not, not a lot, to come in a lecture which is videotaped and the camera is on her face with the zoom in, zoom out, and she speaks and sometimes becomes emotional and sometimes she cracks jokes and the men are looking at that. What kind of a da'wah is this? So this is totally out of the question in Islam. Other religions, it might be good, but not in uh, um, our religion and Allah knows best. Fuad from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ahsanallahu ilaykum, Sheikh. Wa ilaykum. So, Sheikh, in our masjid, Maghrib Adhan is given slightly later than in other months of Ramadan, yani about one or two minutes after the actual time of sunset. In this situation, can we do iftar according to the time of sunset through any apps or websites? 
in other months than Ramadan? No, the answer is not possible and not permissible because you cannot break your fast unless you are certain that the sun has set. Due to the fact you don't see the sun, you have to rely on the adhan, not on the apps. So if the adhan is given, you will break your fast and Allah knows best. Emma from the Emirates. Emma. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Can you hear me? Alaikum assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi Yes, I can. Alhamdulillah. Sheikh, I'm told to get a job so I can earn money and live on my own. My parents want me to pursue a worldly education, but I know it will be a waste of, of their money because I don't wish to work professionally, especially outside the home. I'm prohibited from attending the masajids to seek Islamic knowledge. My parents do not want me to provide, do not want to provide or spend on me. So they want me to start paying them or leave the home soon. So what is most pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? This is dependent on your situation. If they're just bluffing and they will not kick you out of the home, you don't have to do anything. Stay home. But if you know that they're crazy and they don't have any uh, shame when they ask their daughter to learn and work and earn, and they have no problem in kicking her out of the home, you have to start looking for plan B. Plan A is to listen to them and go to school and do your education while abiding by the hijab and utilizing your time, staying away from this toxic environment, meeting other people, and maybe get married ASAP. Plan B is to start earning so that you would leave them and find a, a good spouse and maybe live in an environment with other relatives or other Muslims who would enable you to worship Allah Azza wa Jal freely. But again, I can't say what's best for you in such uh, circumstances because I don't know what's your parents' point of view. I don't know whether you're telling the truth fully or hiding few facts here and there. And Allah knows best. Najwa from the UK. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu If during wudu um, we wash our nose once and then we find mucus on our hands and we wash our hands for which, which takes a few seconds and then we want to the next step, does this break the sequence and thus invalidate our wudu? No, this has no impact on the sequence or on your wudu at all. Nobody says that your hands are full of mucus and so go and wash your face with it or wipe your hands. This is illogical and you don't need a fatwa for this. Remove it and move on. The sequence is interrupted if the phone rings, you leave the toilet, you go and chit chat with your friend and make an appointment for tomorrow, five o'clock to go to the hairdresser. Then you go back and you continue. This is the breaking of a sequence, not a couple of seconds for something that is necessary as this and Allah knows best. Uh, sad man from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Sheikh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, there is a renowned college in my country that is uh, run by the Christian missionaries. And uh, I want to get admitted into that college through a test. But I found out that in the uniform of that college, there is a Christian cross. So, uh, and this is also a only boys college. So should I get into that college or try for that? If the college does not promote or teach upon you or in, impose upon you that you study Christianity or to wear a cross and the likes, there is no problem because m the vast majority of colleges worldwide, even in Muslim countries, are not Islamic colleges. They're secular. But if they impose upon you that you study Catholicism or to wear a cross or to engage in their prayers, in this case, this is not permissible and Allah knows best. Abdurrahman from the U.S. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alaikum assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi so, Sheikh, I heard on another fatwa that you made that it is actually sunnah to give had you went, even if you're going for Umrah during Hajj time, 
But my question is, is that all during all the months of Hajj or if you're going to be there until the sacrifice? And for me personally, I'm going, I'll be, I'll be leaving before the 20th of the Qaeda. So I won't be there until the sacrifice. So my question is, will we have to give a, or not have to give a Hajj? Is it Sunnah to do a Hajj for that time? And also if you will be there, inshallah, can we meet up? So, uh, okay, for, as, as for the first question, al hadi is a sacrifice that is required for someone doing tamattu' or doing qiran. Now, for ifrad in hajj, you don't need hadi. If you want to do it, that's, that's cool, that's fine. And in umrah, you don't require hadi, it's not mandated. Now, it is sunnah to have hadi driven. So those going from Medina to Mecca, they would drive the actual cattle with them. The Prophet sometimes used to send hadi without him going for hajj or umrah. From Medina, he would just send these sacrifices to be slaughtered in the sacred lands and distributed upon the poor and needy around the vicinity of the Haram area. And this is an act of charity. Nowadays, when we fly, we don't have this privilege of having our pet goat or sheep with us so that we could go all the way to Mecca and slaughter it there. We have only one option, that is to buy it there. So if you do this and buy it there and sacrifice it, whether you're going for Umrah or for Hajj or for anything else, or you don't, this is not mandated for Umrah. But as I said, it is mandated for Hajj if you're doing Tamattu' and Qiran, and Allah knows best. Talha from the UK. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My question is for someone that commits adultery, there needs to be four witnesses for the person to receive the. I, I, I the don't understand your question, Talha. For someone who what? He commits adultery. Com okay. There needs to be four witnesses, but it's, um, wouldn't it would it not be haram to look at someone committing adultery? And, uh, and so how could there be four witnesses? That, so does that, does that mean it has to be done in public for there to be a punishment for it? Okay. Adultery can only be proved by the witness of or by the testimony of four male Muslim witnesses being present at the time of adultery. And this has never been recorded in the history of Islam to my knowledge. Because no one is going to be, quote unquote, excuse my friends, shagging a woman and then all of a sudden having four witnesses watching and he's doing his business as usual. This is not heard of and was not, never founded. And probably this is why Islam conceals such a sin to prevent people from slandering. So you cannot just accuse a man for being in a room with a, a, an unmahram woman. You cannot accuse them of committing adultery because you have to have four witnesses seeing the actual act, which is not possible. So if a person was doing it in broad daylight on the street, and four passerby see this, they're not going to go and wait and like take selfies. They've saw it. It's a, a, a single glance of a second or two. That's sufficient. So there is no sin on them because this was not uh, premeditated. It's, it happened and they saw it. So there's no sin. And the reason for witnessing it is to prove that such a major sin had taken place and they would testify for it. So this is justifiable and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. This is all the time we have until we meet tomorrow at 4 o'clock. Same place, same time. It's, well, not the same time, but same place. I leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني 
وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين